Welcome to another episode of The Breakdown. Oh, we got a conversation for you today. This one's going to be spicy. Uh, and, and we're being joined by a, a, a rather fiery character to, to have this conversation. Um, we're going to be talking NDP leadership race. We're going to be popping the cork on the big question. Does the NDP have another uh, leadership candidate potentially putting their, their hat into the ring? We're talking about the investigation into the 2017 UCP leadership race. We're talking about the budget. We're talking about the UCP. We're talking about Daniel Smith. We're covering so much ground today. It's going to be ridiculous. And I am extremely excited to welcome back to the show, former MLA, former deputy premier, former minister. I could go on with all of the things. Uh, I'm just going to get right, right to the point and welcome back to the show, the honorable Thomas Lukasik. Mr. Lukasik, thanks you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I always enjoy it. So we got a lot to talk about, but I'm going to I'm going to start with the big thing, the announcement right out of the gates. There's been a lot of speculation for the last several weeks, if not months, that uh Thomas Lukasik is throwing his hat into the NDP leadership race. This is this is we're going to settle this once and for all. Are you running for NDP leadership, sir? No. Okay then. <laughs> All right, let's move on. <laughs> no, I'm not. I, I, you know, uh, I am not a member of NDP. I, I am not an NDP or whatever that means. Uh, I, I supported them in the last election because uh, it was the right thing to do. And and if there is a candidate that inspires me, then I will pitch in and and help out because I think it's important for this province to um, to have an alternative that is reasonable. But. Uh, no, it, it wouldn't be honest. It wouldn't be fair to NDP. And I don't think anybody who who genuinely believes in 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 all of the values of the party um, should be hijacking this party. And 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 I would be hijacking that party. Oh. Have you seen that candidate yet? I'm curious. Is there one that you're looking at and kind of going, "Oh yeah, I might I might be willing to put some effort behind you." You know, up to now, I know them all personally, other than Ms. Ganley. I never had the, the, the pleasure, the honor of, of of meeting her, but I'm watching her campaign uh, very closely. Um, I am I am a little bit intrigued by by Ms. Uh, Raki Pancholi. Um, I, I think she may be a candidate that will resonate well in Calgary, Edmonton and in rural Alberta. Um, and she will do well with labor and employers. Um, so she checks off a lot of boxes, but I also know Sarah Hoffman, uh, a great lady. But but if if this was the, the finite number of candidates that we have right now, uh, I think I would be hedging my bets with Ms. Pancholi right now. Well, we know that uh, we saw Gil McGowan enter the race this week. And again, because time travel and stuff, we're recording this on the 9th. Uh, and allegedly in two days, we may be seeing an announcement from another potential candidate one way or the other. So the, the field is by no no means set. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about the, the NDP leadership race in a bit. But before we get there, um, there was this press conference yesterday. In fact, some might say that there were three. Uh, and I want to kind of go through your your thoughts on on the the press conference, on the investigation, on the. Quite frankly, I find them a little bit bizarre conclusions. He said cautiously that were presented to uh, Albertans and Canadians yesterday. Um, so let's let's start with there was sort of this announcement that was made that the nd sorry that the rcmp too many too many acronyms uh the rcmp were going to be holding a press conference which was strange for a bunch of different reasons what was your initial reaction when you heard um oh there's going to be an rcmp press conference about a thing and they didn't say the topic until the day of well you know when they said that there will be a press conference in 24 hours on a high profile um, uh, file of public interest, um, I, I quickly run through the cases that I know of that our CMP is working on that would be high profile. And, and the only one it could have possibly been is is the one of, of UCP leadership race. There aren't any 
uh, of, of that would be classified as high profile. And then um, looking at, at history, um, RCMP or any, frankly, police department ever has a, a full-blown media press conference unless charges are laid. So, um, so one would conclude that it's about that particular issue and the charges will be laid. But because of the fact that I was interviewed uh, in this investigation twice uh, to provide the police force with background on politics and how leadership races are are conducted, um, and because uh, I, I I sort of um, anticipated that they would wrap up this investigation knowing uh, what I know. Uh, much sooner, and when I mean sooner, years ago, um, this this sort of stretching of time um, led me to believe that that charges may not necessarily be be laid. Uh, this this file has been with the Crown Prosecutor's Office um, for not months, but but years. And when that happens, uh, you know that that the, the Crown is wait, waiting. Um, uh, for an opportune time to communicate um, uh, something, and 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 they must have concluded that this is the best time to do it at. So you know, one could speculate, but uh, when when our CMP announced that they will not be laying charges, uh, I was surprised. I, I must say, I was surprised because um, uh, I was led to believe that uh, what they uncovered would definitely result in charges. Um, but I. Um, I was more so surprised with with the poor level of communication. Um, you know, we we as Canadians uh, don't expect our CMP to lay charges every time they investigate. They have to be the open, objective, and uh, and only lay charges where where charges are warranted. Uh, and ideally, they should never have to lay charges because in an ideal society, you know, there would be no reason for them to lay charges. Um, but in this case, um, I thought there was there was uh, a lot of evidence that that would uh, result in some charges against some people. But the manner in which they communicated it, they said, well, you know, uh, there were cases more than 200 of of identity theft. Um, but it would be difficult to prove it. And there could be um um, innocent explanations for it. Not that there are, but there could be uh, explanations for it. And at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter because 200 plus votes wouldn't make a difference in the leadership race because um, Mr. Kenny won by more than, I think it was 18,000 votes. Now that is a, is a problem because I think what our CMP missed perhaps in the investigation, or at least for certain in the communication of, the, of their findings, is that the outcome of the UCP leadership race is not, is not the big issue. That's not what we should be focused on. We should be focused on the process. Um, are nomination races and leadership races and elections transparent and fair in Canada? regardless of who wins and who loses you know and and i have to declare my biases you know i i i am not a fan of jason kenny and and he hates me uh with passion and and i accept that a lot of it is earned uh honestly um but but that's not the point um uh, and i don't question the fact that he won and and he would have won i know he wanted to win by a massive landslide so so those 200 votes were important to him at just as 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 that one vote that gets him over the top because he just wanted to uh, to show domination over this new party that he created, but that that's irrelevant. Um, the fact that the the RCMP commissioner in charge of this investigation says, but it doesn't really matter because those he didn't need those two hundred votes to begin with. That is a major red flag. Um, so at the end of this press conference, um, I was um, left with a dissatisfaction um, of not knowing whether uh, these races are fair, open, and transparent. As a matter of fact, uh, RCMP reaffirmed um, more than a suspicion that I had based on my experience and, and, and knowledge of this particular investigation that it wasn't fair, uh, it wasn't transparent, and, and that uh, actual crime most likely has occurred, 
but it didn't have an impact on the outcome. So it doesn't it doesn't really matter. Uh, you know, that's like saying that uh, burglars robbed a house, but the guy was rich anyway, so they only took a small part of his possession, so it doesn't really matter, right? Um, the, the second issue is that uh, based on knowledge of this investigation and, and looking at some of the um, some of the stuff that was being sent to me, most th that 200, and there are more, by the way, than 200, but most of those 200 people are immigrants, uh, predominantly of Southeast Asian origin. Uh, those are people who don't know that they became members of the UCP party. They have no idea that an email was created in their name. They have no idea that a PIN number has been created in their name. They have no idea that somebody voted on their behalf and that they now remain on the list of, of UCP. Uh, that is problematic. And I know that uh, when, um, when there were knocks on those people's doors saying, are you a member of UCP? No, as a matter of fact, I'm not. I support NDP were some of the answers. Do you know that you voted in the UCP leadership? No, I haven't. Um, you know, that is that is something that should concern all of us because, you know, frankly, it could have been me or you. We don't know that unless you actually check your name against the UCP membership list of that time, you won't know that your name was used. And, and, and that is corruption, political corruption at its worst, uh, you know, uh, rigging election processes. And, and let's take it one step further. There are people who cannot be members of political parties because their job doesn't allow him to be one. So, for example, journalists with, with credible networks, uh, people who work in agencies like CSIS and, 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 and others, they, they are simply not allowed to be members of any political party. Uh, they may have been signed up. And, and, you know, 10 years later, somebody can say, oh, by the way, you were a member of UCP party. As a matter of fact, you voted in a leadership race and you would say, I never have been. I and 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 you were and now try proving it that somebody jacked your your identity. So those 200 some people uh, should be concerned, whoever they are. And, and frankly, uh, I would suggest to you they should be seeking some form of a, uh, a restitution for it. Um, you know, from from the UCP party and perhaps from RCMP right now for not um, pursuing this um, to its to its finite conclusion, and and whether there were innocent explanations for it, let the courts decide. Uh, you know, there is nothing more valuable in this day and age um, than our identity. And, and I know I'm going on, but uh, uh, this this subject really frustrates me. But why is this so important? Because if we don't trust our democratic process, then we can't trust anything because everything sort of stems from that. And particularly in a province like Alberta, you know, with the exception of the 2015 election when NDP won, in this province for 46 years, winning a nomination meant you are becoming an MLA, almost guaranteed. And winning a leadership race meant you're becoming a premier, pretty well guaranteed. So it was, it's the nominations and the leadership races that are actually more important than the, than the election. Because that's what gets you into the office. And if parties are allowed to get away with what UCP got away, um, how can we trust anything that stems from that government, you know, uh, trickling down? So, so that is an issue. And what further compiles this issue is the fact that Elections Alberta Commissioner did an investigation on aspects of this UCP leadership and has laid unprecedented fines in hundreds of thousands of dollars against players in that leadership race, which were paid, which to me is an admission. And then that commissioner gets fired by the UCP government and RCMP takes over this investigation. And, and this is where we end up with, with a nothing burger. Um, you know, um, I think Canadians, particularly Albertans in this case, would be justified in saying, this doesn't smell right. And, um, and, and I am not questioning RCMP officers who are investigating this. 
I think what needs to be thought about is the role of the Crown Prosecutor's Office. Because I know in speaking with many police officers um, during, uh, during my time in office and later, that often they do a hell of a job investigating and they put together a package that they know is going to end up in a conviction. And then it goes to the Crown and the Crown says, nah, we don't think so. Uh, I don't think we're going to get a conviction out of this or it's not in the public interest to pursue this file. And and these police officers spend an inordinate amount of time investigating a file and, and you know how frustrating it must be. So this this could be laid at the feet of a Crown prosecutor or three of them in this case in Ontario. Uh, was this was this properly decided? At the end of the day, it was a it was an opinion of crown prosecutors that they shouldn't proceed and charges shouldn't be laid. Um, was this the right opinion? Um, but Albertans, I think, have a right to be dissatisfied with the outcome of it, and not because charges were or weren't laid, but how it was framed um, in the communication package. That yeah. Uh, there were uh, some instances of uh, identity theft, but it wouldn't have mattered anyway. Well, it does. You know, so it, it, immediately watching this press conference, I asked myself the question, what if Kenny won by 199 votes? Would charges then be laid? Would this be pursued further and investigated further? Because now those 200 votes would have made a difference, material difference in the outcome of the election. Should it be the outcome of the election that matters? From my perspective, police should be blind to the outcome of the election and who the candidates were. The question was, was the system clean, the process clean? And it wasn't. I mean, to yeah. me, listening to you speak there, it seems like there's there's sort of three broad uh, areas of, of question for the the press conference for the investigation i think there's questions of of confidence and you know i would certainly be remiss for what this show is if i didn't acknowledge the uh the the and, and i alluded to it in the introduction the the three press conferences because the press conference was scheduled to start at 10 45 and a live stream of sorts started at 10 45 and then very quickly went sideways and was deleted and then a second live stream was started very quickly went sideways although we can we can speak with some confidence that the poor tech person running it was very frustrated because they voiced those frustrations quite clearly and then we finally got almost like an hour later the the third for realsies press conference and so there's i mean the low hanging fruit is just so low hanging that you can't get to the rest without walking into it but one would think that if you're about to do a press conference on, hey, we did this incredible technical investigation, but we can't figure out how to make the YouTubes work, maybe you would have had those ducks lined up a little bit better. But I think that there's also, and I, and I want to be very, very clear, in no way am I trying to denigrate the good work that police officers do. Um, but with this investigation, there are some very real questions as to the consistency of competence let's say that was leveled throughout the investigation there was the the story that came out in july of 2022 in the star that that talked about the fact that there were two uh police officers who interviewed a at the time key kenny uh campaigner and they left their voice recorders for the interviews at that person's house and then didn't get them for a couple of days there's a lot of questions to be asked about that. And that's sort of one of the the problems that I think exists because the, there's two possible explanations that I can see. And this is where I want to get your your perspective on it a little bit. One explanation is both of the 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 investigators just forgot their voice recorders, which is wild. The other one that I'm a little bit curious about is, did they leave them their recording intentionally to see what would happen after that conversation was done? And in either case, the fact that this became a front page media story, um, I feel like that's something that could or should have been addressed in the the press conference, but it it wasn't. What's what's your sort of 
What's your interpretation? And again, to be clear, I'm not a legal scholar. I don't believe you're a legal scholar. Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm certainly not a lawyer. I, what disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. But what's your what's your interpretation of of a big media story like that going completely ignored in this press conference when it does stir up some questions about the consistency or the 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 quality of the investigation throughout the whole course. Well, first of all, I don't think you need to disclaim anything because actually you you are the person that matters. Um, you know, the process, uh, the process of elections, the process of policing and investigating and, and prosecuting um, should um, arouse uh, full confidence in the entire society, not just in lawyers and, and, and legal scholars. Average Canadians should be satisfied that the process is fair, open and transparent and, and totally unbiased. Right. So so if you don't feel that way, there is a problem. Now, the question is, is it a real problem or perception problem? This this press conference um, didn't fully satisfy us that there isn't a real problem, but it certainly compiled a perception problem. You know, if 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 people weren't so sure and were willing to give a benefit of doubt after this press conference, I don't think they're any more assured. I would argue to the contrary. Now, the reason I mentioned, and, and, and you know, the only disclaimer I will make is that I have nothing but respect for cops, and I don't care if there are CMP or... I, I went on ride-alongs. I wouldn't want their job, even if you paid me quadruple that. And, and, and they are amazing at what they do, and they usually get their guy, the bad guy. Um, unfortunately, your rank and file police officers are, are, are caught um, in a situation where there is a perception, let me underscore perception, that police uh, work has been politicized. And we had the case of, uh, of the NDP cabinet minister in Lethbridge that was pursued by some rogue police officers and they were pulling files on her simply because they were conservative and, and she wasn't. Uh, there was the case of, of, of my entire missing file in Calgary police and then the police chief running for office, conservative, you know, a couple of months later. The fact that Edmontonians are even speculating that the police chief in Edmonton will be running for office is is no good because I, I don't know the man and 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 he may be the best police chief in the world but the fact that Albertans are speculating that he may be that's that conversation shouldn't be out there um and and there were a number of sort of cases and now this most recent RCMP one uh, joins the ranks um where that that give rise to this conversation are police forces in any way politicized and I think, as I said earlier, uh, it is high time um, that the oversight of policing uh, gets reviewed. And if if they aren't, I'm fine with that. I, I hope they aren't. Then let's let's deal with the perception of it. So uh, that's one thing. Now, this issue of of these two tape recorders is uh, uh, well, I'm aging myself again by saying tape recorders. They're they're, they're digital voice recorders. Um, is a perplexing one, you know, and again, that's something that needs to be addressed. And 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 maybe there is a, a really good explanation for it. And, and I hope that there is. Um, but at this stage, knowing what I know and knowing what we know, um, two police officers uh, go to interview a key campaign organizer. I'm not a cop, but I imagine before they go and do that, they must have Put together a plan who asks what what questions will be asked who's the good cop who's the bad cop they had a plan they they go to that person's house they lay out two voice recorders i imagine on the coffee table they do a full interview and we find out that those voice recorders happen to have previous interviews from previous witnesses recorded on them so they're not just your clean um recorders with um uh, with just this interview and then both of them get up and leave the house uh, and find out, realize that they left their recorders and obtain custody of them again two days later. So I draw the analogy to you and me going hunting. 
and we plan where we're going to go and we line everything up. We pack our trucks. Uh, we go into the bush. We set up our tent. We sit there for three days and this beautiful elk comes out. And we look at each other and we say, damn, we forgot our guns. You know, you only had one job. And we're job when your job is to record an interview, I don't know how good you are in statistics, but statistically speaking, two police officers leaving two tape recorders when the only job they had was to tape record an interview. Again, it could be a perception issue, but but it's a perception issue that needs to be addressed. So I guess what it all boils down to is the fact that we know that this leadership race was unusual at best. We know that some um, unusual techniques were being applied at best. We know that the justice minister refused to be interviewed by RCMP for some odd reason. Um, Minister Madhu at that point in time. We know that hundreds of thousands of fines for breaking election rules were levied and paid. Um, uh, we know now that more than 200 uh, personal identities were stolen and those people not knowing uh, ended up voting because somebody voted in their name without them knowing or consenting to it. Um, that's what we know. Um, so I think it is very reasonable for Albertans to conclude that uh, this was not a clear and transparent uh, leadership race, um, that we ended up with a leader of a party who then became the premier uh, of this province in a way that begs a lot of questions. And it doesn't matter whether those two votes mattered or not. The fact is that if the process is flawed, uh, the, the whole election is debunked. Even if one vote is found, to be fraudulent, then it puts into question the entire process. I, I want to. I almost want to take your your elk hunting metaphor a little bit farther because. By the way, I never hunted in my life, so it's a. Nor have I. Um, but it 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 almost seems to me like the 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 metaphor should be, we we went out, we had our guns, we shot the elk, we went home, we got home, and we realized, oh, we left the elk. <laughs> that's even, even even a better analogy that's right that's um, right i i mean you've been involved with political parties you've you've been a high-ranking member of 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 highly organized political parties and one of the things that felt like it was missing to me and i'm not sure if this is something that a political party would do or a political party maybe should do this is what i want to get your take on um the RCMP said that they identified at least 200 people who had memberships fraudulently purchased for them. They couldn't nail down exactly who did it, but they identified 200 names, presumably. I have not yet, and maybe I've missed it, but I have not yet seen a statement from the UCP saying, we've obtained those names from the RCMP and we've completely purged them from our records because if the RCMP identified that these people shouldn't have ever had memberships, we don't want them to have any of the complications that you listed off earlier with people who might be involved in law enforcement or, 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 um, is that a statement that a political party should release could release? What are your thoughts on that? Well, UCP is trying to distance itself from this situation uh, as much as possible. They they had a little celebration party yesterday, I imagine, uh, and they figure that this politically won't affect them anymore. Different premier, a long time ago, uh, people have short political memories, and 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 they just simply want this to die, um, and 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 be forgotten. Um, so I don't expect anything of UCP. And look, this is a political party that did it, and now you expect them to come out and 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 take some kind of a moral high ground. I, I don't see that happening. Uh, what I think needs to happen um, is uh, an independent uh, commission needs to be struck, uh, a judicial commission that looks at the whole process of nominations and leadership races, uh, and also a separate one that looks at, at, uh, at the perception of policing. Because... Uh, you know, uh, the fact that you and I are talking uh, about RCMP, we shouldn't be because we shouldn't have feel that there is a reason to talk to. 
uh, and 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 this is this is something that that seems to be growing and we want to make sure that people out there who get pulled over by police who get investigated by police uh or who count on police work to to obtain some kind of justice um have the satisfaction of knowing that they will do their darnest um to get to the bottom of it regardless of who's in government or or who's involved um in in the potential crime that 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 every canadian uh, and every crime gets treated the same way. And and at this point in time, um, I don't think that perception's there. I'm watching social media. I'm talking to friends, um, and and everybody says, "Well, um, you know, something's not right about this." I mean, it's it's disappointing, if but not altogether unsurprising that the the UCP are trying to distance themselves from from this thing. But you know, again, it goes to me there there is a real you know if you if you're an organization and your 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 database has been identified by the RCMP as having fraudulent information in it one would think that the best way to distance yourself would be to say oh yeah we worked with the RCMP and we got rid of all that fraudulent information not to just quietly wander off whistling in a corner hoping that nobody notices because it's 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 not a great look and it but we know exactly how it happened. You know, uh, I actually posted on on Twitter five six years ago emails that were being sent to me. You know, so so the way it happened was was really simple. Uh, friends of UCP, for example, uh, an owner of a fairly large trucking company, uh, whose drivers, uh, um, for one reason or another, happened to be predominantly from from Southeast Asian uh, heritage. Um, uh, puts out a message to all his employees, his drivers, tomorrow morning, bring your driver's licenses to my office. Uh, those driver's licenses, because you have to have a, an actual driver's license or other form of ID, those driver's licenses get photocopied and, and memberships are issued to those people. Now, those drivers uh, didn't know that. They, they thought that they submitted their, their driver's license because their boss needs it. You know, he employs them as drivers. So, so it makes total sense. Uh, they became members of a party and 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 somebody cast a vote on on their behalf. You know, if it was me and somebody told me that um, somebody voted on my behalf for something by by hijacking my driver's license, I'd be furious. Uh, I would I would demand some form of a restitution um, for it or or an apology uh, at least. I would demand that my name be removed off of any list. You know, I, I think most Canadians take their uh, um, their identity very seriously. Now, what else is this identity being used for? I would be asking. The, the problem is that uh, from what I understand, most of the people on the list of 200, I would consider to be from a sort of a more vulnerable population. They don't want to lose their jobs. Uh, they don't want to upset their boss, who obviously supports the government, current government. Uh, they're not going to cause any waves. They're just going to take it. And um, and, and that's that's the most unfortunate part of it. And that is why uh, a party like UCP solicits lists um, from places where they know um, nobody will question them later, even if it comes out. My My concern at the end of this day, yesterday, is that RCMP de facto uh, gave political parties a roadmap of how to rig a leadership race and not get busted. Um, and I think that is a that is a fair conclusion. If they didn't say that there were those two hundred, if they said that we found nothing, this was squeaky clean, or maybe one odd vote, but we got to the bottom of it, and it turned out that. Uh, that it's okay, but if they say that there's 200, but it wouldn't make a difference, um, this is this is a license to print votes. I mean, listening to you talk there, I have to. It's fascinating to me the the situation that you just described because I go back to the press conference that was held a couple of years ago by none other than uh, the current leader of Take Back Alberta, David Parker, and uh, Brian Jean's right hand guy, Vitor Marciano, where they detailed. This is how it was done. Um, it, worth noting that Mr. Parker was heavily involved in Jason Kenney's leadership run. So do that what you will. But um, it's, it's, yeah, it's, is it, 
Have you heard? Let's let's do it this way. Have you ever heard of? I mean, the RCMP, the the inspector who spoke, um, he was asked very clearly, "Has there ever been a case like this?" And he said, "No." Would there be value? Do you think in policing organizations when they're dealing with? You know, obviously they were aware this is a a deeply polarizing, deeply controversial situation. That's why they had their press conference. They were very clear in the press conference that normally they wouldn't do that if they weren't pressing charges. But because of the 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 level of scrutiny on this, um, they they felt the need to to have the press conference. Would that not be a situation where you would go to, I don't know, communications experts and say, what's the best way for us to deliver this message? Because it didn't feel like certainly with the the two false starts and then some of the communications choices that you've already highlighted, uh, it didn't feel like there was a whole lot of what's the how do we execute this in the most safe way possible it feels like that didn't didn't happen is that something that that these organizations should or do do to your knowledge well i don't think police are equipped to carry out these kinds of investigations um because of the fact that this you know police do a phenomenal job for example investigating uh organized crime where there is high tech you know, cyber crime involved, international. Uh, and that's something we should, by the way, touch upon. Um, and they do a good job. But there is no political component to it. In this case, um, th this was within um, the political um, brackets with very high profile individuals at the beginning of the investigation, possibly getting charged. It could have been the premier. He was still a premier uh, when this file was turned over to the Crown Prosecutor's Office. Uh, ministers of Justice and others, right? And 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 big players in, in the business community and and, campaign, and uh, perennial campaign organizers, sort of the kingmakers. So, so th this was a very political uh, file. Um, but... Police should not be treating that investigation and those who are being interviewed any differently just because they are high profile politicians. Uh, so I wonder if they should have had this press conference uh, and, and they said that they never do press conferences when charges are inlaid. So what makes this case so different? Why would you, why would you uh, have this public vindication uh, of the people that you interview, do do others benefit from the same thing? You know, uh, um, if, if I get caught speeding and then I challenge the ticket and I win in court, will they hold a press conference and say, "No, Lukasik didn't speed after all," um, and vindicate me publicly? So this, the fact that they even had this press conference shows that they treated this file differently uh, than any other file. If it was fifty-five um, unknown Albertans. Uh, rigging an election, um, then perhaps I imagine they wouldn't have this press conference. So, so I think it was a bad choice to begin with. But, but you know, neither here nor there. The 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 the, the fact that they had technical issues, I I, I don't blame them at all. I, I'm a, I'm a technology idiot, uh, and I couldn't set it up. So if I can't set it up, I don't blame others for not being able to set it up. Um, I think that the, the whole communication was very poor. Um, you know the words that were chosen, um, the, the, the 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 very fact, that, and I'm repeating myself, but this is the core of the issue. Uh, the moment the commissioner said that at the end of the day it was just 200, and Mr. Kenny won by 18,000, so it wouldn't have changed the outcome. I thought, okay, I, I, this is done for me, because that should not matter at all. And I immediately asked myself that question, but what if he won by 199, right? And and I'm I'm a little surprised that no reporter asked that question. Would you then dig deeper? Would you investigate it further? Would you press charges? Um, you know, it, it, it left me really, really disappointed. But, you know, you asked me about my political experience. I don't want you or your listeners to think 
that elections and nominations were not rigged before, that all of a sudden this is this one big bad UCP that did it for a first time. No, uh, there was rigging, um, except never at this scale, never using as much electronics. When I run for leadership, uh, both Rick McIver and I knew that the leadership race was rigged. You know, telephone lines would go down for five minutes, and then when they went back on, extra 30,000 votes were cast in the system somehow. You know, we laughed. We had no evidence. We didn't have uh, the will to pursue this any further. We just sort of let it be. A lot of the same players, by the way, by the way, who ran that campaign were involved in this UCP campaign. So they sort of did the same thing on a bigger scale. They were more bold and they used more technology. Um, but that's sort of neither, neither here nor there. Uh, but the fact is, rigging of nominations and leadership races happened in the past. I'll give you an example. In rural Alberta, when there was a nomination between candidates, they would rent a hall, uh, a fire hall or something, where, or a community hall where you had to vote in person. And what they would do is, is the organizers who were, who were favoring one candidate over another would let that candidate and his supporters into the hall first. They would show up an hour early before the advertised time for nomination vote. So by the time the supporters of the other remaining candidates showed up, the hall would be at capacity. And believe it or not, they would call a fire marshal. And the fire marshal wouldn't let in any more people into the hall. So the only people in the hall were the people who actually voted for one candidate because they showed up early. They knew that they have to show up early. That happened in PC party and it was sort of a big laugh. But things have changed. Uh, you know, this sort of small time politics no longer is acceptable. This was on a much bigger scale. And this was a case that really was determining, um, you know, who the premier is of, of the province. Uh, um, so you would hope that this would be handled in a manner that today you and I don't have to still be discussing it seven years later. Um, there is a need for reform and that's all there is to it. I, I, yeah. And I mean, I, I think it's important to highlight that these issues uh, these sorts of allegations are also happening currently. I mean, in 2019, there were allegations in uh, Calgary Northeast that there was vote stacking and there were people who were voting multiple times, changing their addresses by going to the bank and and changing their uh, address so they could vote again with a new address. There were certainly in, in the, the last provincial election during the nomination process um, as well. To be clear, the 2019 one was nominations. Um, but, you know, when we're talking about people like allegedly there have been complaints made about uh, Jennifer Johnston, the, the the poop cookies candidate, where there were concerns that were raised during her nomination race that there had been people who were voting who weren't part of the, the UCP membership or they were coming from other areas or other constituencies in order to vote for Jennifer Johnson. And I think it's really important to highlight, you know, sort of what you're talking about here is that when you're talking about if I have a nomination race, I'm running in, uh, I don't know, Calgary constituency four. I'm just making stuff up now to be vague. But let's say that I'm running in Calgary constituency four and I'm running for the, for the UCP nomination race. There's nothing criminal if a bunch of people from Calgary constituency one and two and three and seven and eight, if they show up in Calgary constituency four and they vote in that nomination race and the party allows them to for whatever reason there's nothing criminal about that because at most they would be breaking the internal rules of the party but as you've pointed out breaking the internal rules of the party or subverting them can elevate someone into a position where they become the next MLA as almost a guarantee and they become the next premier potentially well that's and that's the issue that that's what makes some ridings, or in our case, some provinces, uh, very unique, where where winning a nomination means winning the election, because statistically, inevitably, whoever becomes, let's say, the conservative um, uh, candidate for a riding for will definitely win the election. So the, the nomination, you know, I'll give you an example. I know of PC MLAs. Uh, of my day, who for the entire 28 days of election would leave the country. You know, one would go to his condo in Mexico because he knew he's going to win by a landslide. 
without putting up any signs, door knocking or doing anything. So he he always said, I can only talk myself out of winning. So why be here and take a chance? Uh, that's how guaranteed winning that one particular writing was. But he worked like you wouldn't believe it for his nomination. Uh, he made sure that nobody challenges him for a nomination because if somebody beat him in a nomination race, he'd be out and that somebody would, you know, would be the guaranteed MLA for that that particular writing. So uh, that is why I'm saying it, it is high time that Elections Alberta uh, takes full control over all nominations and all leadership races so that we can have the satisfaction that the party is not rigging the process for their favorite candidate or 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 for um you know or for their for premiership or for leadership or 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 you know for a writing um so you don't then have the situation where uh, a leader of a party disqualifies a nominated candidate and just parachutes his friend. You know, we saw the the, the situation in, in Calgary with police uh, chief Rick Hansen. Uh, in a writing where there was duly nominated candidate, people voted, chose a candidate, that candidate got punted and Rick Hansen got parachuted in because Jim Prentice wanted him to be a, a cabinet minister. He lost the election in that case because the community that that elected the candidate who got punted really uh, protested that. Uh, and this was the election where NDP won, you know, most of the seats, but, but historically, um, you know, that's, that's, that's how it's done. So, so democracy is subverted that way, you know, through this, through this process. And, and, and I don't think we're being technical over here. This, this really impacts lives. Um, you know, uh, those are the MLAs that are voting on issues that are most critical for you. This is the premier, uh, particularly in the case of a premier in a province uh, where where really everything is run out of the premier's office, no matter who the premier is. Uh, this is your health care. This is your education. This is your senior benefits. You know, these are the people who are making the most critical decisions that affect your life. I think you should care how they're chosen, how they get to that office. I'm curious, though, wouldn't that I mean, don't we run into the same problem as as proportional representation with that? I mean, because it would require legislative changes in order for Elections Alberta to be able to get into the the, I I agree with you 100 percent. I think that there should be objective oversight for any of these these processes. But, you know, like the the liberals a while ago at the federal level were like, oh, yeah, proportional representation. It's the greatest idea. We're totally going to do it. And then they got into power and they were like, Oh wait, we wouldn't be the ones in charge if we did that. Exactly. So, uh, we're just kidding. Hey, look, it's other things. Um, and you know, I think I feel like it's not uh, out of bounds to say. I think we've seen with this particular government that uh, they will literally change laws to improve their interests their individual interests as opposed to the interests of albertans cough mla gift changes mm -hmm. cough um what would it take do you think to in order to to institute these kind of changes and to influence politicians to actually do that well, you're right. It's counterintuitive for a government to change the rules that got them into government, right? The rules obviously worked well for them. So why why mess uh, with success? So what would it take? Um, if this file, if charges were late on this UCP file, this would have gone before courts. And I think that that in itself would cause politicians to have to respond and change the process. But that won't happen now. Um, so there are only two, really, two variables. A, a decent premier and decent MLAs who will do the right thing, uh, or stemming from the situation that just occurred, uh, public pressure, you know, publicly demanding. Courts can't change it right now because uh, courts inevitably rule that political parties are private clubs and they set up their own rules and they choose their leaders however they want. Um, so, so there is really no recourse. The law, the law is such. We also saw, uh, elections, Alberta commissioner, the moment he started digging and laying fines left and right, uh, he got fired. He actually, he didn't only get fired. His entire office got eliminated. So there is no really investigative body, uh, that specializes just in, in investigating election improprieties right now. 
Uh, but if you go on the Elections Alberta website and you look under the fines levied, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of dollars it is, but but it's an inordinate amount of fines that were levied against UCP um, candidates, players, organizers, campaign managers um, for for uh, transferring money into the campaign and 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 whatnot. Um, you know the, the evidence is there. Uh, but it will take now either public pressure or or exceptionally decent uh, premier and MLAs to say that this is not acceptable anymore in 2024, and and Albertans and Canadians deserve transparency. I got one other question on this, and then I want to talk about the leadership race and a little bit about the budget um, while I have you here. <laughs> so, um, but you know, one of the things that that struck me as confusing i guess was the because there were two the two big allegations that were included in this in press conference were the the fraudulent votes but then there was also the piece about the the callaway kamikaze campaign and was there fraud that was perpetrated because um uh mr callaway allegedly was running according to the elections commissioner was former elections commissioner there's so many qualifiers um the was part of a, a coordinated campaign that was run in order to say mean things about brian jean and then throw the support behind kenny which is ultimately what happened but at the press conference it seemed like the defense against the fraud question was well he he there he didn't demonstrate that he wouldn't have done the job if he had somehow gotten it and I'm just curious what you took out of that whole piece of the press conference, because I was like, I was watching it and I was listening to it and I was like, wait, so if you somehow, despite your intent to drop out of the race and you were getting coordinated speech notes from Matt Wolf, who was working on Jason Kenney's campaign and providing timing things. So despite all of that, as long as you say, but you know, if Kenny had been hit by a truck or something and I hadn't dropped out, I would have totally been premier if given the opportunity. That's the get out of jail free card somehow. Like, did you take something different out of that? Am I no, missing no, it, it, that, that explanation defied the logic and, and, and the election that uh, let's pre-qualify the fired election commissioner levied very heavy fines uh, in, in this case and, and came to what I would say a pretty definitive conclusion. Um, RCMP, I think, uh, or the Crown Prosecutor's Office in this case, gave a lot of latitude. And they said, well, you know, we can't we, we can't prove the intent uh, that, that that's what he was trying to do. Um, and 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 again, poor communication from RCMP. I'm not I'm not sure, but it left a lot of doubt in my mind. But you're right that if if he didn't drop out, or if Kenny dropped out, um, then uh, then Mr. Callaway would have stayed and would have been happy to be a premier. So they didn't establish that he never wanted to be a premier. As a matter of fact, he didn't want to be a premier, and the only reason he was running was to get this job done, to get rid of uh, Brian Jean, to, to discredit Brian Jean. And the moment that job is done, he's stepping out, right? They didn't establish that. Well, I, I don't know what candidate, a kamikaze candidate, would, would, would say that. Um, but all evidence, one could say, was, was at least led the elections commissioner to the conclusion that this was all established. There was a meeting at which Mr. Kenny was, the plan was made. There were there were individuals who were at that meeting testifying, saying, "Yeah, well, that's exactly what we agreed to." Uh, and then, as you said, there were uh, the resignation speech was written by Jason Kenny's campaign. Um, uh, it, it played out exactly like it was planned out. Uh, but the RP, RCMP said, "Us, yeah, but if it played out differently." then it would be different. Well, we all know that, but it didn't play out differently. It played out exactly the way they planned it. Again, you know, either RCMP didn't fully grasp the essence of the issue when they were investigating it, and they were investigating it in terms of organized crime uh, and didn't understand the political context and how politics works. And, and I, I thought I provided them with pretty decent background on that. Um, 
or they are horrible at communicating what they did and didn't do. Yeah, because what they communicated to me sounded like, to use a, a metaphor, but the what I took away from what they communicated was basically if somebody had gone to a bank with the intent of robbing the bank, and then they did, in fact, rob the bank, a, a defense would be to say, well, yeah, but if the bank hadn't been there, man, then I wouldn't have robbed it. I mean, I did, but... If the bank hadn't been there, I wouldn't have robbed it. So, like, you can't charge me. And it was just a very, I am going to have, I'm going to be processing and rewatching that section of the press conference for a while because I was so confused by it. Um, but let's, let's change the channel a little bit. Mm. Unless there's anything else that you wanted to say about the, the, the investigation, the press conference. No, no, I, I don't think there is, there, there is much to add. It's, okay. Uh, it left me puzzled. I, I've never seen anything like this. I would be inclined to agree, um, but but that's just that's just my life. I'll, <laughs> I'll end the segment with with that that obscure little reference. But uh, let's talk a little bit about the NDP leadership race. So uh, you're not running, mm -hmm. um, but what are you what are you taking away from the the NDP leadership race so far? We've seen some fascinating campaign strategies from some of the candidates. I mean, Raki Pancholi has been putting out policies gangbuster style. Um, she's she's putting out some very innovative policies. She's putting out some policies that are definitely going to resonate with the NDP base. Um, Sarah Hoffman is like, I don't know how she's she's dropping like six endorsements a day, it feels like. Um, and she's touring the province as well. Um, and then we've seen from the, the Ganley campaign, question mark, uh, or at least proxies of the Ganley campaign. There's there's been some some very strong language used in regards to potential candidate uh, Nehead Nenshi. So from where you're sitting right now, from the the spectator seats, uh, what are your thoughts on the the NDP leadership race so far? You know, th this is an interesting campaign um, because these candidates, the, the current candidates, with the exception of the newest one that just entered, uh, Miss. Uh, well, we got Gil McGowan was the most recent one. And then we have uh, Jody uh, Stonehouse. Stonehouse. Ms. Stonehouse. She hasn't quite well defined herself yet. And in fairness to her, she hasn't had a time to do that. So we'll see how, how she positions herself. But otherwise, from the current declared candidates, they, they define themselves uh, very well. You know, Ms. Ganley um, wanted to be the Calgary candidate without a doubt, you know, she was supposed to be the Calgary person, um, with, uh, NDP government roots. She was, she was with, with Notley. She was in cabinet. I have the experience of a cabinet minister and I'm a Calgary person. Um, Miss, uh, Miss Hoffman, uh, wanted to define herself as the hardcore NDP. I've been with NDP forever. Uh, you know, I wore orange diapers when I was a child, um, I, I I attended all the protests and rallies that could have possibly been attended, and I've been deputy premier and a cabinet minister. Uh, I have uh, the pedigree. Uh, I'm a true NDP. -er. Um, Miss um, Miss Pancholi says, you know, I'm as much of an NDP. -er. I, I I'm in in this caucus. I'm an MLA. I'm a big fan of Rachel Notley. Uh, but I think that we need to rethink ourselves a little to become sort of the naturally governing party in this province. So uh, uh, we, we we need to reconsider some of our positions. She's running more of a general election to become a premier campaign than uh, a leadership campaign within NDP. So so now we have these sort of these main candidates, but everything's about to blow up because in comes uh, Gil McGowan, um, who is your hardcore labor, I would say on the radical side, uh, labor guy, um, who will definitely affect uh, Miss Hoffman and, and her union labor pedigree, because he he will be fighting for that same base. He, you know, he he prides himself on, on going to some kind of a protest or, or parade or, or, or something every day. Um, then comes in Nenshi, who is Mr. Calgary, uh, that sort of blows up Gangley's uh, standing, but he also comes in as I'm an I'm an outsider. I I never you know uh, do orange, 
Um, I do purple, in fact. Well, what is purple? You have to mix red and blue to get purple. Uh, so he's a conservative and a liberal mixed, but no NDP affiliation, you know, whatsoever. So he sort of also cuts into Miss uh, Miss Pancholi because he's sort of the outsider, as as they like, they will definitely portray him. Um, so so the dynamics will change when when all of them come in. Um, this reminds me of the leadership race um, where Stelmach won. You know, everybody didn't think Stelmach's going to win uh, because he was far second um, in, in the polls. Uh, there was a shining leading candidate, but that shining leading candidate didn't get it, didn't get his 50% plus one vote on first ballot. And then all the other candidates said any, anybody but and supported um, Stelmach. And Stelmach ended up getting fifty percent plus one on a on a second or third ballot. It was so. Uh, I think unless Nenshi gets fifty percent plus one vote on the first ballot, which I don't think he will, um, one of the runner ups, uh, the the three candidates that I mentioned, um, is going to uh, going to win the day. Um, you know, NDP is in a is an interesting political party. Um, you know, you asked me if I'm going to run, and I said I am not an NDP, and I could never become an NDP. A, not because of for ideological differences, but also, it's hard to become an NDP. You know, a, a liberal MLA once told me uh, there was a time when liberals and NDP were talking about a merger uh, to beat the PC party, and the liberal MLA once said, "You know, I, I could never become an uh, an NDP. They would never accept me because you almost have to be raised by the wolves." You know, to be a to be an NDP uh, MLA, and uh, NDP has to make a decision in choosing their leader. Um, do they want to be that hardcore NDP that still reminisces about the good old days in Saskatchewan and Tommy Douglas, where most people, you're in my age, don't know who the hell Tommy Douglas was, and where they are happy? as another NDP MLA told me, they're happy to just get two seats in the legislature because you can rest on your values, rest on your laurels and, and say, look, we, we are true to our values. And even if we get beaten miserably in every election, we're not going to change because this is who we are. Um, sort of like that, uh, you know, uh, from Mighty Pythons, just a flesh wound, you know, uh, when, when he has all his limbs already cut off. Uh, or do you want to get an NDP leader who still holds true to the core values of NDP, but is electable as a premier and can win the election and can get majority of seats? Now, I think a lot of NDP rank and file members think that they can pull Rachel Notley off again. They they honestly believe that they won the 2015 election because they found that ideal leader, Rachel Notley. And I think um, Rachel Notley would be one that would also concur with this comment is that no, NDP did not win the 2015 election. As a matter of fact, they didn't think they're going to win until the third week of the campaign. We, the PC and Mr. Prentice, did everything we possibly could to lose that election. You know, other than actually withdrawing ourselves off the ballot, uh, we, we did everything else for them. You know, we were the kamikaze campaign uh, for uh, for the NDP. Um, we I don't know if we wrote the acceptance speech for uh, for Miss Notley or not, but but that's probably the only thing missing. So so thinking that they can form government again by by basically not changing anything and finding someone who's like Notley is not the answer. The answer is that they have to become a naturally governing party, which means that they will have to shift on some of their policies. And I'm not saying sell out. Uh, I'm not saying abandon some of the great values that they have, you know, fairness, environment, uh, treating workers um, fairly and safe workplaces and 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 social services and good healthcare and education. I, I think most Albertans believe in that. Sometimes you just have to rephrase it and sell it differently. And the question is, who will be that candidate that can rephrase it and sell it differently in Calgary, in Edmonton, and in rural Alberta? 
Um, that's the question they should be asking themselves. Now, Nenshi will be an interesting thing because he uh, he's not an NDPer. Um, I think he will be basically establishing an Alberta party. You know, he wanted to be a leader of the Alberta party, but we all know that starting a new party from scratch, like Alberta party, was a no-go. Nobody could make a go of it. Why not become a leader of NDP and, and start a new Alberta party? Um, I don't know how NDP members will respond um, to Mr. Nenshi being their leader um, when he for sure has no pedigree. Uh, the only thing he can say is, look, I'm going to win a government, but NDPers will say, but for whom? Not for us. I mean, just going back to what you said about the PCs being the the kamikaze candidates for the NDP, love that. But I, I just feel like I should assure you, I feel confident that had the PCs won, they would have formed government, so you didn't do anything wrong. That's true. We <laughs> wanted it. <laughs> Um, yeah, thank you for those, for those, for those insights. Um, I want to talk a little bit while I have you here. I also want to talk a little bit about the budget, um, because we saw a provincial budget roll out in a fascinatingly bizarre way because it was preceded by, uh, its actual rollout with Daniel Smith doing her provincial address where she said, Hey, everybody, you know, this is what we need to do and this is how we're going to do it and fiscal responsibility. And then the budget came out and it was none of the things that she talked about, except for borrowing a bunch of money to put it into the Heritage Savings Trust Fund, which to be clear, we borrowed money to put it in the Heritage Savings Trust Fund. Um, it was none of the things that she described in the speech, but at the same time, it didn't really seem to address a lot of the concerns that a lot of people had. And there's one particular niche thing I want to ask you about, and then... Um, then I want to hear just sort of your general thoughts. I mean, you've been part of a couple of budgets. You've had frustrations with previous budgets that have been well documented, uh, even within your own party. Um, the, there's a piece particular to Edmonton, though. I mean, we've we one of the things that I found um, I'm going to go with horrifying is the deficit that exists in regards to education funding you were a former minister of education this is why i want to like really drill down on this section but i mean the the edmonton school board just talking about edmonton here we're not even talking about the whole province but just talking about edmonton the edmonton uh school system is looking at uh, we had a meeting with uh, we're doing an episode with the edmonton public school advocacy network that's going to be airing just after we do this one um and they were talking about the fact, and I, 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 it's so ridiculous that I can't help but like laugh because it's one of those laugh or cry situations. There is a billion, with a B, billion dollar structural deficit inside of just Edmonton. That is to say that it's a billion dollars to get schools to where they should be for mm -hmm. just the buildings, just mm -hmm. talking the buildings and one of the other numbers that they threw out is that there's a hundred or sorry ten thousand seats uh ten thousand students that are going to be entering the the school system that don't have funding so as a former minister of education when you're looking at the education section of this budget what are your thoughts so first of all going back to danielle smith's uh video that eight minute video that she did preceding the budget <laughs> Maybe she used the same communications company that RCMP used for their announcement uh, because that video shouldn't have happened because what she said in that video 100% contradicted the budget she was about to table in the legislature. So why put yourself in that position where you and I can say, look, you just said something else a week ago. And in that budget, what was very important to me is that she talked about diminishing our reliance on, on um, the resource revenue, which means oil and gas. And when she talked, there was a point in time, and actually a, a reporter called me and said, did you get the same thing? There was a point in time where I thought she actually is going to introduce PSD. Because she went so far about talking how we cannot any longer rely on the fluctuations, the ups and downs of oil and gas prices, which we don't get to control as, as a province or a country. 
uh, and that we need stable sources of revenue. Well, what, what are they? The only stable sources of revenue is taxation. And, and being a conservative, I, I, I prefer consumption taxes like, like VAT or, or value-added taxes like PST or GST. So I thought she's actually going to go there. And I would be the first one saying way to go because we should have made that decision a long time ago, but it would never pass through caucus. Uh, and nobody has touched it since. And 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 we know how Brian Maroney, uh, late Brian Maroney, um, was treated when he introduced uh, GST, even though he replaced uh, a manufacturing tax and, and saved Canadians money. So it's it's very. So I thought, why why are you going there? The problem with the budget is that um, she did not address that. As a matter of fact, she compounded our reliance on resource revenue. Uh, because at the same time, she blocked any investment in green energy. So if, if you're trying to diminish carbon um, source of revenue, why not allow private sector to invest in other sources of revenue? And and there she's going to run herself into a lot of trouble with farmers because she spearheaded this, this big fear mongering that government is going to take landowners' rights away from them. And, and she just did that in a, in a most spectacular way. So So farmers maybe haven't figured that out yet. But education budget, building schools is one thing. And this population is growing at a very fast pace from a population perspective. Uh, and and we, we continue to sprawl in both Edmonton and Calgary. So these new neighborhoods require more and more schools. Um, you know, I always said as an education minister at that point in time, I said, you know, we frankly actually have enough schools in Alberta if we can only put them on dollies and move them around. Because we had schools that were empty. Uh, we were closing schools while we had neighborhoods bursting with children that had no schools. And, and these buses would be crossing the entire city to, to deliver them to schools. Uh, so we had schools where there are no kids and we had kids where there are no schools. And that problem continues to grow. But building schools is one thing. And... Um, but you have to staff them. Otherwise, they're just, it's like hospitals. They're pretty buildings. You know, school without teachers is, is nothing. And there is nothing in this budget that accounts for, A, hiring more teachers for the schools that they are going to build, which basically means they're transferring the problem onto school boards because they will sure as hell be there at the ribbon cutting ceremony for the new school. But now you school board worry about staffing because that's who the employer is who has to hire those th teachers. And the question will be, where from? What what money is going to pay for those teachers and and the salary obligations? You know, so that's uh, that that is a a critical problem that hasn't been uh, worked into both in the education and the healthcare budget. The second part is that that they're arguing that they're giving an increase, but but they actually massively cut the education budget at a time when we have an unprecedented growth of students because they haven't kept both to enrollment and to inflation. So if if your enrollment is up, let's say five percent, and inflation is five percent, um, you would need about ten percent increase just to keep you at the same level as you were last year. No extra money, um, but they haven't kept up with enrollment and um, and inflation. So I know that right now school boards are putting their budgets together and they're scrambling because they are having less money at their disposal today than they had last year at this time in year. And also the, their classrooms in some parts of the cities are bursting and they have nowhere to put to put those students. So it, it is a real issue. And, and, and I don't want to say that we never had that issue. You know, we, we, we had that issue. When I became a minister of education, we actually did a massive one-time injection um, into the system of, uh, uh, of dollars. Um, but the pressure was always on, but the pressure is growing and, and governments seem to be sort of ignoring it. The second thing, or third thing that they never gave any consideration in this budget, and I don't understand why, is the upcoming collective bargaining agreements that are being negotiated and will be soon negotiated. So this current budget, if you just read the budget, assumes that there will be zero increases in, in wages and benefits uh, in any of those agreements. Because if there is an increase, or if it goes into binding arbitration uh, or, or the labor board, and there is a ruling on what the increase would be, there's nothing in the budget. There is no margin left in the budget to allow for uh, for settlements of, of, of collecting bargaining. So I'm not sure what the plan for that is. Um, they may have to run interim 
uh, supply bills to the legislature to just get more money um, and, and hide the deficit that way. You know, not don't put it in the budget, but when we actually land with the bill, we will just do a supply bill through the House. And it's not part of the main budget, but it's the same thing. Um, so I'm not sure. It wasn't it wasn't a very well thought out budget. I, I like that cigarette tax. And I know if you have any smokers listening, they 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 will object to it. But I, I think from a health perspective and, and long term savings in healthcare, um it, those quote unquote sin taxes are, are the way to go. Um, but otherwise, you know, there was really nothing innovative, but it did not address those very important points that Danielle Smith identified in her speech. And and I, you know, I, I'm not a fan of UCP government. Uh, everybody knows that. But if, if she does something that is really courageous and good, I'll be the first one to say, you know, in this case, good on you. And she identified um, two really good uh, points. A, if there is surplus after you pay all your bills, let's put it into Heritage Trust Fund, although I think there's a better way of dealing with it. And B, let's diminish our um, reliance on oil and gas. And she puts out the statement, but a month, about a week or two weeks later, she tables a budget that contradicts all that. So I'm not sure what the purpose of it was. Do you have any concerns? I mean, uh, there's been plenty of people who've done analysis on the budget. And when you take a look at, at this year's funding for things like healthcare and education. It's not keeping up with any of the the growth things. But when you take a look at what this budget projects into the future, it actually drops off. So there's decreasing funding for healthcare. There's decreasing funding for education, which is wild because we're about to blow the healthcare system up and nobody knows what that's going to look like. But we're going to have a lot of private companies providing services for somehow less money, even though they have to maintain profit margins. I'm no economist. It gets very confusing for me. Um, but do you have any concerns about the fact that as you take a look at the year over year over year projections for this budget, it projects less money for some of the areas that are expected to have some of the biggest growth in utilization? Yeah. So we have uh, as a province not just education or healthcare we, we have a major structural problem in, in our budgets and and uh, those who are giving us advice in the pc government were saying so i'm sure those who are giving ndp advice and i am certain that that uh, danielle smith is hearing the same thing and that's why she had this seemingly good video because she she went there um but then she stopped and didn't do anything about it the problem is this that this province doesn't have enough revenue to operate the programs that we operate. And, and there isn't really much that you can cut. You know, people will say government is inefficient. Well, uh, and if you run it like business, first of all, government is not a business. Um, if, if there was anything that government does that makes money, private sector would pick it up and do it and do it better. Government only runs departments that are loss leaders. Healthcare doesn't make money, it loses money. Paving roads loses money. But it's a service that you have to provide to society so that truck drivers can deliver goods to stores, so that economies can grow, so that people can be healthy and work. And, you know, so we provide sort of the, the fundamental basics so that others can enjoy their lives and make money. But government is not there to make money. But this government in Alberta for many years already hasn't had enough revenue to operate those important programs. And, and in caucus and in cabinet, I, I often drew the analogy of a drug addict, or actually more so of a, of a gambling addict. So, and, and you can really draw another analogy to a household. Imagine if your bills for utilities and deferred you know, roof repairs and everything that you have to work into your monthly budget were $2,000. But you only make $1,500 a month. So you're falling behind $500 every month. So what do you do? The roof is leaking, you don't fix it. And, and the problem becomes bigger over time because you haven't fixed it. But what you're hoping for that tomorrow at the casino, you're going to win enough so you will be able to fix that roof. And thankfully, up to now, we were lucky. And, and there would be a big spike up in oil and gas prices. We would 
catch up on infrastructure. We would build the schools that were needed and we would sort of catch up. But then revenue goes down again and we don't have the month to month revenue to pay the teachers, to pay the doctors. And we're again hoping like that bumper sticker used to be, you know, that we will not pee away uh, the next boom. And then we fix things again. So every time there is a boom, we sort of catch up on the things we didn't do for a long period of time, which usually end up costing us more. And, and we pay individually a price for it. You can't run a province like that. And all experts will tell you that the right thing to do is to generate steady revenue that covers your, your operating expenses, your month-to-month -month bills. And then if you win extra money in a lottery or in oil revenue, you do one-time projects that you can operate out of your general revenue moving forward. Always assume that there will not be another win. And if there is one, use it for one-time projects. Unfortunately, that one-time project was supposed to be, as Premier Lockheed established, um, this Heritage Trust Fund that you just sort of keep on putting money into it for rainy day, as he called it. Uh, for the longest time, we never drew from it. Then we started drawing interest from it, so it didn't continue growing. And then we finally started dipping into the principal, and we depleted the whole thing. So Danielle Smith, rightfully so, wants to build it up. But she's building it up by borrowing money. It, that, that's not what Lockheed wanted to do. You don't borrow money to put into savings. You know, it, it really doesn't make a lot of sense. And while you're behind on your monthly bills and your roof is leaking. So that hasn't been really taken. So it makes for great rhetoric. It, it makes conservative think that conservatives think that we are fiscally responsible, but actually we're anything but being fiscally responsible. That's not how you would run a business. That's not how you would run a household. And and it shouldn't be how you run how you run a government. Um and and it's a problem that's starting to catch up to us. And and we're seeing it more and more because the infrastructure, and I'm not only talking about physical infrastructure, buildings and roads, uh, but our social network uh, programs are starting to crack. They're starting to show the lack of ongoing maintenance. And you know, if you want to bring it to a, to a common everyday experience, there used to be a time when I was still in government, uh, when we met with Saskatchewan politicians, they always envied Alberta. And when you drove, you knew when you entered Alberta just by the quality of roads, uh, because ours were so much better. And uh, we're no longer there. We used to have the highest funding per student in education. We're at the bottom, actually. Believe it or not, we have the lowest per student funding right now. We uh, used to be in the top seven education systems in the world. And because Alberta is in a country, um, they, they had to rate us separately because in Canada, every province has its own education system. But Alberta, not Canada, Alberta was in top seven. There is an organization in Paris that every three years, I believe, PISA, it's called, um, analyzes our education systems. We used to export our curriculum. We used to make money on selling our curriculum um, to other provinces and other countries. Uh, we used to set up schools in foreign countries for, for diplomats, kids, and others to attend because we were perceived to be one of the leading English-speaking education systems uh, in the world. We're losing that. And, and if you are a fiscal conservative, if you are an employer, what do you need the most? You need skilled workforce. You want your education system to be good. Um, it, it, that's what makes business run. Um, we're slipping on that. And and you know what really upset me in this in this education budget was that there was an actual decrease to education budget, but there was an actual increase to private schools. And that's surely driven by by Danielle Smith's ideology and her connection to, you know, mostly Christian groups, but religion groups that want to run their private schools. And I have no issue with private schools. Uh, but to me, the term private means privately paid for. Um, or at least if you don't believe in, to, in that, give them the same increase or decrease as public education gets. Um, but to give public education a severe cut and increase significantly fine funding for private schools, um, that tells me that your priority is no longer education, but it is the groups and how education is delivered. And, and that's a problem.
Any other big takeaways from the budget? Any other things you think people should be focusing on? Well, you know, what people should be focusing on now are the collective bargaining agreements. There are many unions that 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 have their contracts coming up. There are many unions that have been frozen at zero for a long, long time. Uh, they're seeing oil prices being at a reasonable rate right now. Um, they will be at minimum asking for retroactive and ongoing inflationary costs so that they can get the same pay as they always did. We're not talking increase here, just to keep them at level. Uh, that's not in the budget, not even close. So, uh, you know, she may talk big talk conservative and say, oh, well, unions overpaid, lazy and all that. But the fact is that there will be a time where this will come before a binding arbitration, where political, you know, uh, boisterous uh, talking will be done and a ruling will be made what a fair wage increase is. And none of that is built into a budget. And I I can tell you that in, in cabinet meetings of my day, this would have been an issue that's raised to the Minister of Finance and say, look, you know there are settlements coming up. We don't know what they are, but we sure as hell know they're not zero. Where is that in your budget? It's not there. Mr. Lukasik, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to chat today uh, and for you. being as generous with your time as you, as you have, as well as being willing to cover as many sort of huge, it's, this was not a light fair conversation, um, but being willing to, to offer your perspective to some, some incredibly important issues. Is there anything else that you want to draw people's uh, attention to? Is there anything else that you want to have people looking at uh, before we have you on the, the program again, which we definitely will. Cause I always love it when you bring your perspective. Well, you know, I, I think what is important is something we should be keeping an eye on are, are a couple of things. Uh, one, um, our provincial government made a very interesting ruling where municipalities, if they want to get any direct funding from the federal government, they now need a sign off from the province. Now, for a province that has a minister of red tape reduction to introduce a brand new layer of bureaucracy um, is 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 puzzling, but the question should be asked why. You know, municipalities, especially smaller towns that don't have a big bureaucracy, they have a town manager and a couple of employees, and that's it. They often apply for grants and programs to federal government directly. You know, it could be something as as silly as a celebration of Canada Day to buy fireworks or or whatever it may be stages. Uh, it could be uh, for some kind of an event, you know, pumpkin festival in St. Paul or whatever it may be. And federal government has programs for that, and, and they dispense those dollars across across Canada. Now, in Alberta, they will need to get a permission from provincial government to get funding that they normally get all the time and have been for 100 years from federal government. Um, that is interesting uh, because it has nothing to do with fiscal conservatism. It has nothing to do with reducing bureaucracy. Uh, it has nothing to do with, with actually, don't we want Ottawa to spend as much money on uh, Alberta as possible? But it has to do with this, um, and I call this sort of junior high school level pettiness of, uh, of, of not letting federal government do anything for Albertans unless we say so that it's okay and funnel the money through us so that we can announce the money and and to make sure that federal government can never be seen as doing anything good in Canada and particularly in Alberta. So that's something to look at because this will be uh, very important uh, for smaller municipalities. And another one that has to do with municipalities that we should be paying very close attention to uh, is Danielle Smith's insistence on city councillors, town councillors, Reeves and mayors running on a party ticket. Uh, she wants to have party system um, introduced, and, and you know, and the reason small towns work as well as they do. I was um, I was recently uh, speaking uh, with I think uh, with a town council in in, in eastern part of uh, our province, a small town, and I tell you how delightful it was. 
uh, this, the town councillors, I actually could not tell who were the conservatives and who were the lefties on that council. They sort of worked well together. Uh, they had several projects that they were excited about in their town. And and uh, I thought it must be a pleasure coming to council. As a matter of fact, I asked them, I said, you guys uh, are a great team. Uh, and they are. Now, you put party structure into that, and now they have to label themselves blue or orange or red or whatever they are. That blows it all up. Uh, why would you want to polarize it other than trying to again, control municipalities and, and fund campaigns and make sure that municipalities basically do everything you want them to. The autonomy of, of municipalities will be shot. And, and as you know, um, Mr. Parker um, is doing a lot of organizing of that for them. Uh, I, I recently, I didn't know that I blew up a big secret, but there was a secret meeting in, uh, I believe it was uh, Rocky Mountain House uh, or, or, or Sylvan Lake. Uh, where Mr. Parker and Minister Dreeshen were going to have an organizing meeting to form a constituency association, brand new one, to run a mayor and councillors in that town as UCP um, candidates. Other jurisdictions have shown where they introduce politics into uh, into city councils. A, uh, people don't participate more. It doesn't increase voter turnout, but it sure as hell polarizes city councils. And, and, you know, in big cities like Edmonton and Calgary, they fight like cats and dogs among each other anywhere. Do we want to pour more gasoline on it? But particularly in rural, small town Alberta, uh, where they work really well and everybody knows each other and they elect this guy to be a mayor or this woman to be a mayor because they always lived in that town and they do a great job in, uh, in the 4-H club or something. Why should he or she have to now become a member of a party? And, and and listen to someone in Edmonton in the legislature telling them how they should be running their town. Um, you know, for it, it, it is as anti-conservative um, as it can possibly be. We believe in small government. We believe in less bureaucracy. We believe in, in, in towns managing their own affairs. We should be only enablers. Um, and in this case, um, this is a massive uh, injection of bureaucracy and... Uh, and, and central control. I hope that uh, uh, residents, particularly of rural Alberta, will say, no, we will not allow you to do that to our councils. Because you know what's next? School boards is next. I, I'm laughing, sir, because um, I had three other topics that I was was toying with with introducing. Um, and and. They were school boards, municipal parties, and take back Alberta and their influence on on school boards. And you just nailed it. Oh, sorry. All, all three of the no, that's good. I, I'm curious though, since since you brought it up, and since I'm notorious for saying one more question, uh, one more question. Um, you know, Mr. Parker has he, he kind of got uh cor the he put forward the appearance of being corrected, is how I'm going to to phrase it. Uh, he offered up a, um, uh, I can't call it an apology because he was very clear he wasn't asking for forgiveness, but a, a justification explanation uh, that went out through social media as well as through Take Back Alberta's uh, email list. Um, he's been very, very clear that his intention for the next set of uh, the next chunk of democracy in Alberta is the municipal elections and particularly targeting school boards. You know, some people are saying, well, you know, maybe he actually means the things he's saying um, and, and maybe we should give him a second chance. But given that he's he's made it very, very clear that his mandate, his life's work uh, for the next couple of years is going to be ensuring that take back Alberta has full control of school boards. How alarmed do you think people should be and what should people be doing once they reach that level of alarm? Vote, right? Vote. Um, Parker, from my perspective, um, has a very disturbed view of, of, um, of how society should be structured, how governments should be run. Um, and what our priorities in 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 a Western society should be, but that's his thing, you know. That's that's his homeschooled um, upbringing, I imagine, and and he's entitled to his opinions, and and he's entitled to organize people. That's what democracy is all about. 
But the fact is, we know that this is a fringe minority, and they can they they I know they don't like being called that, but they are a minority, and they are on the fringe of views. But if the rest of Albertans who are more mainstream um, don't engage and don't vote, he will win. So it is not that he is a great organizer. I don't think he is. Uh, he just gets his vote out. And unfortunately, we are horrible organizers and we don't go and vote. So his small group of people wins the day because they actually go out and vote. They're they're fanatical. They're, they're passionate about what they believe in. So they, they go out and vote. Um, most, as Ralph Klein used to call us, severely normal Albertans who are busy with kids and hockey and, and, and whatnot, um, we think that 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 sort of life will perpetuate itself, and we don't need to get engaged. And 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 now we are seeing that that is not the case. Um, so you know the, the solution to every single problem that we identified in our conversation today, from from the issue with RCMP to elections Alberta uh, to budgets and everything else, all that would change if we gave half an hour of our time once every four years and actually went and voted. Uh, and then we would get the government uh, we want, and and we would get the policies we want. We would get the candidates in our towns representing us uh, that we want. But if we don't do it, um, we get the government we deserve, and and you know, and and stop complaining because it is not that we voted the wrong government in. We didn't vote the right government in. Um, because we would have if if we voted, you know, our our election participation is 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 pitiful, and um, and that's why small minority groups that organize well, that belong to either churches or or other religious institutions, um, can mobilize in a hurry. They're structured already in a way that they can mobilize their vote and and they come out. Particularly when when an operator like Mr. Parker presses the right buttons. And and instills fear in them that there is, you know, that their values, that their way of life is threatened. They, they will come out and vote. When in turn, actually, if we enjoyed our life in Can our lives in Canada and Alberta up to now, that is threatened, and we should be the ones coming out and voting. Very well said, sir. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Again, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, I, like I said, I always really, really value the the conversations that we have when you're willing to come on the show. So thank you very much for that. And uh, uh, I hope you have a great weekend, what's left of it. I shall. And keep up the great work. Those conversations that you are starting are extremely important. And they have never been more important than they are now. Well, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. And that's it for another episode of The Breakdown. As always, if you appreciate the kind of content that we're trying to produce here, we would love nothing more than if you thought about signing up to be one of our Patreon sponsors at www.patreon.com slash thebreakdownab, where for just the price of a fancy cup of coffee a month, you can help us continue to produce this kind of content. Whether you're listening to the audio version of the podcast, in which case maybe leave a, a, a review and a rating or whether you're watching it on one of our streaming platforms we want to say a big thank you to everybody who is part of the breakdowns audience and as always take care of each other and keep the conversation going <laughs>